Hey friends, so Valentine's Day is coming up and I thought I would offer you a quick and cute watercolor demonstration for a potential Valentine's card. You can always scan this card afterwards and email it to friends or send it to someone you have heart eyes for. For today's demonstration, I'm just using a student quality watercolor block. This one is by Canson and I'm working on a nine by 12 format. And the wonderful thing about blocks, if you are new to this concept, is that the paper is already stretched. So it's glued around all four corners. And when you're finished the painting, you actually will just be sliding. Um, I use a, a thin plastic ruler, but you can use a credit card or potentially a palette knife um, or a fingernail under this slot and you just separate and pop off all of the paper. So watercolor block is really convenient for these purposes. And I'm going to be showing you a large illustration, but you can paint whatever size you want. This is a cold pressed 140 pound paper. And again, it's just a student quality, but we're just doing a fun light illustration here. Before we set up the palette, I want to have my sketch ready to go. So I'm using an HB pencil. If you wanna go a little bit lighter, you can work with a 2H pencil. And I also like having my kneadable eraser handy. That's just one of these sort of gummy erasers and they are nice and gentle on the surface so they don't compromise the paper if you have to do any erasing. I'm just going to center this um, for simplicity and what I want to do is just create a little bit of an elliptical shape to the upper portion of the cupcake. We're going to draw the base first and then add the cupcake and the icing to the top. So there's an elliptical shape and I just move my whole wrist to capture that shape. And the good news about this is this is organic looking, so it doesn't have to be perfect. And then I wanna do an arc on the bottom just to give myself a bit of a target point. Now we will have a little bit of perspective in the paper cup. So I'm going to be starting with a center line and then I'm slowly going to just fan out, almost as if we're pivoting on an imaginary point, fan out some ribbing on the paper cup to the right and to the left of that center line. Ideally, the spaces closest to the center of the cupcake will be a little bit wider. And then perspective would tell us that they get a little bit more compressed and a bit closer together as we move towards the edges and it wraps around the cupcake. We'll deal with the edges in a moment. So I'm just gonna leave a little bit of space here between the paper cup and the cupcake itself. And you can decide how high of a dome you want your cupcake to have. I'm just going to create a little bit of a dome right here. And you can see that already it's starting to come together really nicely. The next thing I'm going to do is just give myself a little bit of another disc here. And this is going to show us where that little swirl of icing is going to be located. And I can even decide how high I want it at this point. So perhaps I will say that it's going to end here. Now I can create a light structure just to set some parameters for myself for the little twist that I'm going to make. And that way I've got a bit of a guideline to work within and it will um, be a little bit easier when I'm designing the swirl. I'm gonna get rid of the extra lines now that I don't need that we're indicating the cupcake itself. And I'm going to just start casually drawing in some of the piping. And it's going to be kind of looping around like this until it comes to a final little swirl on the top. Now, my pencil is quite dark. I'm doing this for your benefit. 
If I was actually doing this on my own without it being a tutorial, I would be using a much lighter pencil. This is a little dark and a little greasy for my liking. So I'm almost creating these steps that kind of gradate and get bigger or smaller depending on which direction that you're going and um, kind of will show us how we can step from one layer of piping to the next. And let me get rid of that old guideline so you can see this a little bit more clearly. There we go, here's the illustration. And then depending on the kind of icing you want, typically with piping, it's not as rounded as I have it here. So if you wanna create more of a, a peak, you can create an edge here. And the same thing on this one, maybe I'll create more of an edge to show that it's sort of twisting, almost like a piece of ribbon. I'm coming from an illustrator fine art background, so I might end up getting a little fussy here. So I'm gonna to try to resist doing anything too fussy and keep it nice and simple. Now the uh, same will be true for the ribbing around the paper. Currently we just have one smooth line going across, but what we want to do is move almost like a, um, uh, like a curtain, you want to have this fluted sort of effect to the cupcake paper. So we want to go in and out, in and out. And I'm coming out where I hit a line and I go in towards the cupcake, out towards the line, in towards the cupcake, out towards the line, and so on. And those little scallops that we're making should get tighter and tighter as they move around the cup. Again, that just gives us a little bit more perspective. Would you like to put a berry on top? If you would, or maybe you want to put a chocolate heart or something, you can do that and plan for that ahead of time. Again, because we're working with transparent colors here, we want to plan everything we can in advance with our drawing because we won't be able to go over our pencil lines and cover up any mistakes afterwards. So I am going to put a little chocolate heart right here and just embed it into the icing. So some of this chocolate heart will be covered in icing. So I'm gonna get rid of the icing portion. And if I wanna make this more 3D, I can create a little edge on the heart like that. Okay friends, I'm going to now lighten up my pencil because it is a little too dark. I'll show you the image one last time. So what I'm gonna do is just take my eraser and turn it into like a little worm or a snake and then roll it over the surface. And that is a really quick way of lightening your pencil without fully erasing it just using that nice little kneadable eraser. It's time to move on to preparing our palette for our painting. We're not gonna be using any masking fluid in this video. It's going to be super straightforward and I'm gonna show you my palette setup and the colors that I'm going to use. We're gonna be working with a really simple color palette today of permanent rose, raw sienna, alizarin crimson, burnt umber, and ultramarine blue. You can definitely check out all of the colors and supplies that I'm using in the description below. So this is going to be my palette set up. I'm right-handed, so I always keep my palette on the right-hand side along with all the tools. So just flip this scheme if you are left-handed and um, I'll have a link down below as well to remind you of the setup and send you to another whole video where I describe exactly what I do. For today's video, 
As I mentioned, working really minimally here with just a handful of colors, I like using my flat filbert brush here for mixing. Um, this is available through my line of brushes. I love using a synthetic brush because it is um, a little bit more rigid and it doesn't absorb as much paint and there's less waste that way. So I like to have a piece of paper towel set up here to blot my um, brush and control some of the paint to water ratio and of course a handy test strip. So I'm going to be starting by wetting my brush in some clean water and I'm going to be pulling out all of the colors I need so that I'm not scrambling last minute to um, make these as I paint. So I like putting out the colors first and then um, I'm all ready to go and I'm not worried about things drying up on my paper. So the first pool of color I'm going to be putting out is permanent rose. So you can see that I'm digging around in the well quite aggressively and I don't have a ton of water on my brush but my brush was activated with a bit of water. So I deposit that color out into my mixing space and then I rinse my brush. The next color I'm going to be putting out is alizarin crimson. Now they do look a little bit similar but the alizarin crimson is just a little deeper and warmer. I like to put my color out and then I add water to it. That way I can control the saturation level and I don't accidentally dilute the pigment too much. The next color we'll be using is ultramarine blue. So now that this water container is a little contaminated uh, with the pink, it will affect my blue mixture. So I'm just switching to clean water. So pick up a little bit of clean water and then I'm going to dip into my ultramarine blue and put that out in my palette. We're not going to be needing much of that. It's just going to be a tiny little pool. And you could be mixing this elsewhere if you've got a, another palette, but I've got lots of mixing space here, so I'll be just fine. Rinse that. And I'm going to want a little bit of raw sienna just enough to make our little cupcake watercolor illustration glow. And then the final color will be burnt umber, which is kind of like a chocolatey brown. Now with watercolor, it's important to work light to dark and do all of your wet into wet mixtures first and work your way to a drier surface. You'll have a lot more control over your paint that way. And with working with uh, transparent colors as we are, it's a natural progression from light to dark. So what I wanna do is I can take either a brush or I can take a dropper and add water to my pools. Just for simplicity, I'm gonna be adding a little bit of water to my permanent rose mixture, and then I'll stir that up. Now I will leave a little bit of concentrated pigment over here and I'll just pull out from the pool a bit more of a diluted consistency. So I can test on my test strip here and that's about right for the effect that we're going for at this moment. And then the next thing I'm going to do is dilute the ultramarine blue. I'll add a little bit of water to the alizarin we may be getting to these colors a little later on, so we may have to add a bit more water um, if they dry up in the palette. So adding water to the raw sienna and then adding water to the burnt umber. Once your paint colors are all mixed, you're going to want to refresh your water. So make sure that you're starting your painting off with nice clean water jugs or cups with water. For this painting, I will be using my number 10 designer blend and it comes to a really good point. So it's kind of like having three brushes in one. If you don't have a brush like this, you can make sure that you just have on hand um, a very small number one, a three or a six, and an eight or a 10 round. Now to begin, as I mentioned earlier, I always like working light to dark. It's especially important for beginners. It will give you a lot more control over your pigment. 
and I want to start with the icing because it is the lightest element in this painting. And we're going to start with a wet and to wet technique. So I'm just going to be dipping my brush into water and I'm going to apply clean water to the surface of this icing. And that's going to create a nice little skin so that our pigment can float on top rather than absorb into the paper right away. I'm going to imagine a little bit of a light source coming from the left hand side. So I'm going to fill this up with really light permanent rose, so very watered down, very diluted. And I just want to make sure that the point of my brush is always pointing towards the outer edge and the belly is in the middle. So that means turning it around if I need to. I'm going to take a little bit of raw sienna and then just drop that in. It's going to give a little bit of a creamier, warmer look to the icing. I think I'll build up a little bit more color on the side. So again, because we created that skin of watercolor on top, the paint is just flowing really nicely and we've got lots of time to play here. I'm taking a little bit of tissue and I'm just blotting this left hand side and that will create a really quick highlight on that one side. Now we can move on to painting the paper cup because it's not touching the icing there's no risk of the two areas bleeding in together. So I'm going to start the same way just pre-wetting this paper cup using the point of my brush to fit into the little grooves or the fluted areas of the paper. And I want this to seem really artificial, so I'm really going to load up the permanent rows here. I'm just poking the tip of the brush into those little folds. And this doesn't have to be flat or perfect. I'm just going to keep it natural. So the value or the intensity of the paint can fluctuate. And in fact, it tends to be a little lighter on the top and darker on the bottom. Just as the paper is coming away from the cupcake. Now for fun, you could leave it here or you can add, even just without rinsing your brush, a little bit of that burnt umber. And the burnt umber is going to suggest a bit of that chocolatey hue from the cupcake itself is coming through the paper. So I'm just doing it in stripes to emulate the folds in the paper cup. Now it's a good idea to let things dry at this point. So I'm going to grab my hair dryer. So the next thing we're going to do is a bleeding out technique. And I like doing this technique when I've got small areas to work in and I've got a couple of colors that I want to um, float into the surface or onto the surface of the paper. So for me, I want to create some folds in the piping of the icing and I'm going to start by just wetting one side of the fold and dropping in a little bit of the alizarin crimson. And remember the alizarin was a little bit warmer in color compared to the permanent rose. Watercolor is attracted to wet paper, so it won't go beyond the area that you pre-wet. It stays within those parameters. I'm going to take a little bit of ultramarine blue and just suggest a tiny bit of a shadow on the edges. I'm going to skip a bit of a space and now I'm going to show you the same idea but painting on dry so you can choose which way you like to apply your paint. So I'm going to do the same thing but this time just apply it to a dry surface. Keep a little bit of a space of the lighter color of icing from our underpainting. And now I'm going to drop water in before it dries. And that will kind of push the pigment aside and create a little bit of a highlight in the middle. And it pushes the pigment to the edges. So it's another way to create an interesting value. You can even soak up some of the pigment if you like. And once again, I'm just going to add a little bit of ultramarine, which will give it a violety cast. 
and I'm just doing that along the bottom edge this time. This isn't a real cupcake, so we don't have to worry about making it ultra, ultra realistic. That technique is a lot faster for me, so I'm gonna continue on working on dry, always leaving a little bit of an edge between the different um, piping. So again, dropping a little bit of ultramarine, still working with my alizarin crimson and working on dry. You can drop a little bit of water to lighten, or you could also take some twisted tissue here and soak up to create highlights. You don't have to put the ultramarine blue into every single fold. Totally up to you. This one is on the lighter side because it's on that left hand side. So I don't want to um, have it too dark over there. I'll build up a little bit more color here. I'm going to do two twists over here. A bit more of that ultramarine. The ultramarine just gives kind of a shadowy cast to the pink. Now, if you wanted to lighten this after the fact, even after it's dried, you can take some clean water and a little brush and just give a light scrub to the top and then blot it out. And again, that just sort of emphasizes that we've got light coming from that left-hand side. Now we're gonna revisit the paper cup and we're gonna do so on dry. So what I want to do is take the permanent rose and now with a smaller brush or with the point of a larger brush, it's up to you. I'll show you with my small one here. I'm just going to start with skinny lines on the edge and the dark shadow is going to be in the uh, concave part of the, um, the fluted fold. So it goes into the concave part and the highlight is going to be on the rounded part. Doesn't really matter um, in the end if you make a bit of a mistake because this is just a fun little illustration and whoever you're giving it to is going to love it no matter what. Adding a little bit of that ultramarine to create the feeling of a cast shadow. Now that this has had a chance to dry, I can lighten it up a little bit. And the lines can become thicker in the center part. Again, that will just give us a little bit more perspective. So I can quickly run my tissue and just blot around that upper edge, maybe around the bottom. You can see how quickly that gives the illusion of depth to the paper. And before that dries, I'm using my ultramarine just to drop in a little bit of a cast shadow. In fact, I'm going to run it along the bottom here and just bleed it into those strokes. Now you can wait if you are um, not a very experienced painter. You can just wait a little bit and let that dry completely. That would be the safest thing to do. But if you have a bit more experience, you can do what I'm doing here. I'm just dragging some of that ultramarine through. Okay, so I'm going back in with a little bit more color and I'm taking my small number one brush, working on a dry surface and just emphasizing 
some of the creases in the piped icing. So exaggerating the lower edge and the right hand side. Taking a little bit of water and just bleeding out that line before it dries completely. This one already is dry, so I will just add a bit more pigment so that it's a bit more gradated in the way that it fades out. bit of water to fade it out and I'm going to create a flipped edge here advanced move <laughs> just turning the edge of the piping and once again just grabbing a little bit of ultramarine to suggest a bit of a cast shadow and we'll stop there Okay, so um, I don't have a lot of space for my chocolate cupcake, but nonetheless, we can squeeze it in here. I'm going to start with a little bit of the raw sienna. I'm just working on dry, because that will give me a lot of control. And I'm going to go in and out, following the pattern of the paper and the white area that has been left behind. Now, because this is a light, whimsical illustration, if you've got a little bit of white paper showing um, here and there, I think that that's actually quite charming, so you don't have to try to get rid of all your white paper. Now I'm dipping into the burnt umber before the raw sienna dries, and you can see how lovely that is by just dropping the burnt umber along the iced edge, how it just bleeds into the raw sienna because it's still a little bit active in in spots and then I'll just carve out the uh, edge of the paper and I think just to make this brown look a little richer I'm going to add a bit of alizarin crimson on the right hand side where that cast shadow is and a little bit more of the ultramarine blue and this will give just a darker brown. I almost never, ever, ever use real black. Uh, I prefer making shades of browns and grays. So the ultramarine, the alizarin crimson, and the burnt umber together will uh, make this nice chocolatey brown. So just adding a little bit of ultramarine blue and using this as an opportunity to carve out a more accurate shape if needed to the icing. And you can see this one side is still quite light. If it's not, you can blot to just create a little bit more volume and a little bit more of a highlight. Still think I need a little bit more color here just to offset those two piped areas. They're not standing out enough, so there we go. And I think I'll go into the permanent rows again and then create a final kind of contrasting line on dry in my paper cup. And your cup might be fine just the way it is. If you're a little bit more advanced and you're looking to just pump things up a little bit more, this can be a nice little modification for you. And I've switched to the ultramarine blue here just to emphasize a feeling of shadow. Okay, so I'm gonna put on a nice glossy chocolate heart. 
So I'm going to start on dry with my raw sienna. And this might be an unlikely color, but it's going to give us a feeling of light and shadow. So I want the light coming from the left hand side. So I'm leaving a few little light spots there. And then I'm going to dip into the burnt umber. Ideally get back here before it dries and just float this in. If it dries, it's not a deal breaker. I think I need a bit more of the raw sienna. And really what we're trying to achieve is a gradation of value from the dark chocolatey brown to a little bit more of a golden hue and then finally a little white highlight. If you have masking fluid and you want to use masking fluid for your highlight to preserve it, that's absolutely fine. I'm just going to cheat a little bit and use a very fine line of the burnt umber to enhance that outer edge here. And then once again, to deepen that chocolate brown, instead of using black, I'm actually gonna use that ultramarine color and that will just add one more layer of darkness to our chocolate heart. Just creating a bit more of an edge Heart. And I'm going to just drag a little bit of that color into the icing and that will really make it seem like it's sitting in there nice and grounded and the color would reflect on the lightness of the icing just a little bit as well. So we're going to let this dry. We can totally leave this illustration just like this, or we can take it one step farther and add a few cute little sprinkles if you like. I'm going to do that with my permanent rose and a tiny little brush. Your icing has to be completely dry. I'm just going to create a few little random natural looking shapes in no particular pattern. Any of the spots on the left-hand side need to be blotted. Create a few little sprinkles here. Try to make them as random as you can. And they should be popping off the edge a little bit as well because they are 3D. So once those are dry, we can put a tiny little cast shadow and you can just blot them to speed up the drying time. I'm going to add a little bit of darker permanent rose. So by darker, I mean just slightly drier, more concentrated pigment on the right hand side of these little flecks. I should probably put a few more over here and have a few popping off and to make them seem like they're in shadow. On the far right hand side, what color are we putting? That's right, we're putting the ultramarine blue. And the final touch for me will be to add a little bit of a shadow. So I'm taking my nice soft round brush, wetting what would be the table surface. And I'm going to take my ultramarine blue and just put a cute little shadow just to finish this off. Bit of a cast shadow. And I'm glazing over the cupcake paper want a little bit of influential color so I'm adding a tiny bit of the pink. Once again you can stop your 
more illustration right here, or you can take it one step further and add a little bit of fun splatter to the background. I'm going to use my ivory fling, which is my fan brush from my line of brushes, and just add a little bit of fun splatter to this painting. So I'm wetting my brush, dipping into the permanent rose, and to get big splatter, I'm just going to stand by with a little bit of tissue, just going to flick my brush at the paper, and I'm going to go into my ultramarine blue as well. Just a nice little way of finishing the negative space of the white of the paper. You could write someone's name that you want or love or happy Valentine's if you've got good penmanship to really bring this home. If you really enjoyed this video and are sharing it on social media, be sure to tag me. I'd love to see the results. Thanks for watching everyone. Until the next time.